As I said before, one of the key things about um, looking at formalism is actually taking pre-critical responses and trying to think about them critically. These are all choices made by an author. One of the most basic choices that an author can make is that of point of view. As a basic review, point of view refers to who tells us a story and how it is told. The point of view shapes what we know and how we feel about the events in a story. Some key related terms. First, point of view character. The point of view character is the central figure in a limited point of view narration. The character through whom the reader experiences the author's representation of the world. We also have terminology that allows us to label and describe the type of narration that we're given. The first person narrative is narratives where we can only access the thoughts and perspective of the POV character. The narrator speaks through personal pronouns such as I and thus limits the amount of information that we're getting from outside of their experience. Now there's also second person narrated. Uh, that's generally uncommon, writing from the reader's point of view, utilizing you as the dominant pronoun. Now you'll find this in some children's literature, especially in the choose your own adventure style books that were popular in the 1970s. They made a bit of a resurgence in the 90s. There was a Goosebumps sub-series of create your, uh, choose your own adventure stories. Also found, strangely enough, in some of the macabre EC comics from the 40s and 50s. We'll actually read some of those here coming up, but I've actually included an image from Fantastic Fears number five, uh, which was published in January, February 1954, uh, art by Steve Ditko. You can read the narration caption uh, on an illustration of someone sinking into a, a pool of goo. The caption reads, they look and don't see you. Then they glance down at your thin, shivering pool of a shapeless body. Beside you is an empty bottle that once held a promise of life that was supposed to soften your flesh and bones, not melt them. But they don't notice the faint smile on your fading face, as you know you've cheated them, and as you know this is the end. A lot of horror second-person stories end with the character dying. but um, Pretty common is the third-person narrative. The narrator seems... Uh, to be someone standing outside the story, a non-participant. This refers to all the characters by name, uh, or as he, she, they, etc. Now, there are two different types of third-person narrators that we need to be concerned about. There's omniscient narrators, a narrator that knows everything that needs uh, to be known about the characters and events in a story. It's free to move at will in time and space and has privileged access to characters' thoughts, feelings, and motives. Then we also have the limited third-person narrative, uh, a narrator that is confined to what is experienced, thought, or felt by a single character or a limited number of characters, but usually only one at a time. Even in a third-person limited narration, there's still typically one or more point-of-view characters that we as readers accompany. Now, point-of-view offers us an interesting discussion point, as point-of-view controls the kind of information that we can receive as readers. Now, you can tell Hatchet is written in a third-person limited point-of-view. We can only see things through Brian's eyes, the point-of-view character. For instance, when he sees the pilot die, quote, the pilot stopped as a fresh spasm of pain hit him. Even Brian could see how bad it was. The pain drove the pilot back into the seat, back and down. Now, we only experience that through what is observable by Brian. Brian is seeing the physical effects, the performance of the pain rather than feeling the pain himself. And even we have the moment where Brian is making an observation. Even Brian could see how bad it was. But compare that to say when Brian is experiencing bodily pain himself, like when, quote, his stomach tightened 
into a series of rolling knots, and his breath came in short bursts. See, we're getting information that's only privy to Brian. We're getting a lot more visceral description of those feelings instead of a description of his physicality responding to that pain. Now, there are moments when I is used outside of dialogue, but the dialogue is internal. For example, the text says his forehead felt massively swollen to the touch. I'm alive, he thought. I'm alive. It could have been different. There could have been death. I could have been done. But as you can see, there are quotation marks that could be kind of implied here. If we put quotation marks where there aren't any in the actual text around I'm alive, around I'm alive, and then ending with been done, I've added those quotation marks in, and it makes sense. The he thought phrase is sort of the dialogue tag. Those, those quotation marks are implied, um, but it, it sort of preserves that third person narration. Now, it's important to identify as much as we can about the narrator of the story. It helps us determine where the author stands in relation to the story, as where is where we as the readers stand. Now, of course, it's a mistake to assume that the narrator's perspective is the same as the author's. A narrator's perceptions may be accepted, rejected, or modified by an author, depending on how the narrative voice is articulated. A narrator can even intrude upon the story, offering his or her opinions on the events as they unfold for the reader. Point of view is one of the most integral choices an author can make. They're chosen for very specific effects, and most stories would be very different with a change in perspective. And that's the key component here. The form a text takes is a choice. Think of how different this story would be if we were privy to information that Brian wasn't. Would we feel as hopeless as he at the situation when he thinks, quote, I wonder what my father is doing now. I wonder what my mother is doing now. I wonder if she is with him. As far as the reader knows, his parents are mystified as to his whereabouts. Are they even looking yet? Or have they stopped looking? Have they given up? Are they grieving? Or are they vigilantly searching everywhere they can? And that's the key question. I wonder if she is with him. Who is the him in this quote? Is it his father? Is he thinking his parents are rekindling their relationship over their shared love of their son? Or is it the other man, someone who's replaced Brian's father in her time of need and solace? Because we as the readers are limited in the amount of information that the narrator and thus Brian has given us, it's giving us a very specific effect on how we're reading it. And as you can see, that change a point of view, that choice, could greatly change the way we experience the story. I want you to keep in mind other areas in the novel that you feel like point of view is either limiting the amount of information that we're getting or giving us privileged information that we wouldn't have otherwise. Keep that in mind when you're writing your response posts for the discussion board, and I'll see you in the next video.